Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to a Song of Ice and Fire. Drogo, son of Barbo, the call of calls, Danny's sun and stars, and all that. But who was Call Drogo truly? He's only in one book, and our access to him was very limited. Drogo very rarely spoke. And when he did, it was short and to the point. But when you look a little deeper, what you see is a man that was very different than his fellow Dothraki. A call unlike any other. A visionary on a mission to change the world. Who also seemed to have a meticulously designed plan that would turn his dream into reality. So, let's do this. Since it seems particularly relevant to this topic, we decided that briefly outlining what Essos was like prior to the Doom was a good place to start. Beyond the forest of Kohor, Essos opens upon a vast expanse of windswept plains, gentle rolling hills, fertile river valleys, great blue lakes, and endless steppes where the grass grows as high as a horse's head. From the forest of Kohor in the west to the towering mountains known as the Bones, the grasslands stretch more than 700 leagues. It was here, amidst these grasses, that civilization was born in the Dawn Age. Ten thousand years ago, or more, when Westeros was yet a howling wilderness inhabited only by the giants and the children of the forest, the first true towns arose beside the banks of the River Sarn, and beside the myriad vassal streams that fed her on her meandering course northward to the Shivering Sea. So, this passage from the World of Ice and Fire describes what could only be labeled as an idyllic location for people to live. Fertile valleys, abundant sources of fresh water, and a network of rivers that would be perfect for transporting goods. And that is exactly what it was. This was a place where people flourished. There were numerous towns and cities. Farms stretched as far as the eye could see. It was the home of one of the greatest ancient civilizations in Georgia's world, the Kingdom of the Sarnor, and they prospered in these fertile plains for thousands of years. And then, the doom came to Valyria, and everything changed. Their towers are all fallen, their cities ruined and abandoned, and noxious weeds and tall grasses grow where once their farms and fields and towns were found. The lands that they once ruled are but thinly peopled and traversed only by the wandering calisars of the Dothraki horse lords and such caravans that the calls permit to make the long, slow crossing from the free cities to Vase Dothrak and the Mother of Mountains. Travelers name these the Haunted Lands, for the many ruined cities that dot them, or the great desolation for their emptiness. But it is as the Dothraki Sea that these grasslands are best known today. That usage is comparatively recent, however, for the Dothraki are a young race, and it is only since the Doom destroyed Valyria that their Kalsars came to dominate these lands, sweeping out of the east with fire and steel to conquer and destroy the ancient cities that once thrived here and carrying off their peoples into bondage. So, there it is. Following the doom, the Dothraki came sweeping out of the east with fire and steel to conquer and destroy the ancient cities that once thrived here, and carried its people into bondage. And it only takes one quick glance at a map to see that central Essos is, in fact, a great desolation. Millions of square miles of nothing but grass and ruins, known as Vase whatever the Dothraki decided to call it after they killed or enslaved everyone that once lived there. No one dares to plant roots anywhere between Vase Dothrak and the free cities on the Narrow Sea. 
with the exception of Norvos and Kohor, who are the only surviving inland cities in all of Essos. If you exclude the areas that immediately surround the free cities, the entirety of Essos is a wasteland that produces nothing. Following the doom, the Dothraki spread like a virus and infected the vast majority of Essos, transforming it and its economy into one that's largely reliant on the slave trade. So why was it only after the doom that the Dothraki became so bold? Well, it seems pretty obvious. They feared the wrath of the Dragon Lords. It wouldn't have taken more than a Dragon Lord or two to wipe the Dothraki off the face of the earth, so they never dared to venture west. This is backed up by a conversation where Eri and Jiqui tell Danny that dragons are terrible, evil beasts, and that they're all gone because brave men killed them. That pretty much lays it all out there. The Dothraki view dragons negatively because it was the dragons that prevented them from spreading their barbaric savagery all over Essos. And now that we've set the stage, it's time to go full Drogo. Khal Drogo is no ordinary Dothraki man. He's not even relatively normal for a call. One of the first things that we learn about him is that he has a manse in Pentos. The Dothraki are not a people who have permanent residences. They're nomads that sleep in tents. And Drogo's manse is immaculate. It's lavishly decorated with sophisticated ambiance containing elements of various cultural influences. In other words, it isn't just something that he accepted as a gift that he doesn't much care for. One might have expected someone who's lived in a tent their entire life to sort of destroy the place, but not Drogo. He maintains his manse like someone who truly values it. Then, there's the people who are there when we see his manse for the first time. Drogo's manse was filled with important men from all over the world. That is definitely not normal for a call. Why does this man have friends from all over the world, including the Summer Islands and Ib, which are obviously not even reachable by horseback? And even more intriguingly, why are these men friends with him? And just to be clear, Danny does not make note of any of them looking like they were scared to be there, so it's not like it was fear of him that drove these men to his house that night. This was a stereotypical high-class social gathering at Drogo's place, and rich and powerful men from all over the world traveled great distances to be there. There has to be a reason. But before we go too far down that road, let's return our focus to Drogo as it seems that better understanding who he is will make the rest of this fall neatly into place. One of the first truly interesting things about Drogo is the fact that he wanted a Targaryen bride with the blood of the dragon. And it's actually quite revealing when you take a second and think about it. As we mentioned a few minutes ago, the Dothraki have negative views regarding the dragon lords of Old Valyria. So his decision to seek out a Targaryen bride is relatively eye-opening, and sure to raise a few Dothraki eyebrows. So, why did he do it? Well, in our eyes, the answer to that question can be found somewhat indirectly in something that occurred on the night before their wedding. Drogo gave his manse over to Danny and Viserys, and it was here that Danny had her first dragon dream. That seems a bit odd, doesn't it? Illyrio gave her those eggs as a gift from him, but since she never dreamed of dragons prior to this night, it seems to us that this was likely the first time she was in close proximity to the eggs. What does this tell us? That the eggs were never at Illyrio's palace, which implies that they weren't even Illyrio's to give. The eggs were Drogo's. But why would Drogo go to the trouble of having Illyrio give them to Danny instead of just giving the eggs to Danny himself? 
in our minds, most likely due to the fact that the Dothraki view dragons as evil. His fellow Dothraki wouldn't like seeing him give dragon eggs to a Valyrian, but Illyrio giving them to her wouldn't raise an issue. And the result is still the same. Danny has dragon eggs. As we've mentioned a few times before, there does appear to be a direct correlation between the presence of a female dragon lord and dragon eggs hatching. Drogo wanted dragons, and so to not raise anyone's alarm, he gave the three eggs he acquired to Danny by using a proxy gifter in the form of Illyrio. But why did he do this? Drogo appears to have been very interested in uniting all the Dothraki under his banner, otherwise known as fulfilling the stallion that mounts the world prophecy. Before we even meet him, he was already well on his way to accomplishing exactly that. It's hard to say exactly how close he is, but I don't think it'd be an exaggeration to say that he already has close to half of the Dothraki in his Kalazar, and it seems like he might have begun to realize that a little something extra would be needed to get the ball across the goal line. If he had obtained the dragon eggs, which seems likely, he would then need to find himself a female dragon lord to hatch them. And since his fellow Dothraki might not appreciate him taking a Valyrian wife to begin with, he wouldn't also then want to be seen giving her dragon's eggs. So he arranged to get it done in a more discreet manner. And yes, we do realize that there are probably quite a few eyes rolling out there right about now. But before you dismiss this idea completely, first consider the manner in which George elected to introduce Drogo to us. He had Viserys refer to him as Aegon the Dragon Lord come again. George could have had Viserys call him anything, but he decided to refer to him as a Dragon Lord. And, if we're correct, the parallel doesn't just end with some random thing that Viserys said. Aegon had three dragons, including a huge black one that was his dragon. Drogo had three dragon eggs, including a huge black one that would one day be named after him. Even his name, Drogo, sort of evokes dragon. So, when you begin adding all this up, Khal Drogo really starts to become a pretty intriguing character. And to be honest, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface yet. Besides having friends from all over the world, a wonderfully decorated and meticulously maintained manse, and a desire for a dragon lord wife, all of which are pretty much the antithesis of what it means to be Dothraki, he also has a taste for fine wine. So, while the rest of the Dothraki are sloshing down fermented goat's milk, this guy's sipping fine wine. That's kind of the modern equivalent of a bunch of blue-collar guys heading out to the local watering hole after work and having one of them order a $350 bottle of 2005 La Rioja Alta while the rest of the guys are chasing well whiskey with Budweiser. Drogo is a man that has developed a taste for the finer things in life. He's traveled all over Essos, seen how the rest of the world lives, and he seems to like it. He's sort of the Ragnar Lothbrook of the Dothraki world, in that he's thrived and risen high in their world, but is highly intelligent and seems to want more. He is not like the rest of his people. This is also evident in his behavior with and towards Danny. He doesn't treat her like other calls treat their wives. He listens to her when she talks, and he most certainly doesn't let his blood riders pass her around, which is a common practice among the Dothraki. She's actually important to him, and he actually cares about her. Nowhere is this more readily apparent than their wedding night. Danny was horrified by the casual barbarism on display during the celebrations. Then it came time for Drogo to give his bride her wedding gift. It was a beautiful silver mare. Danny loved it, and Drogo was genuinely happy that she liked his gift. Then it was time for their first ride, and as they slowly left the wedding party, 
Danny grew fearful of what would come next, the consummation of their marriage. Now, this scene happens completely different than it did in the show. In George's version, Drogo took her to a very secluded location and treated her with tenderness, wiping away her tears, lifting her from her horse to seat her on a rock, and then placing himself on the ground so that they may look into each other's eyes. Together, they undid his long braid that had never been cut. And he, deftly but tenderly, undressed her. But when she was finally down to bare skin, nothing happened. For a long time, he just sat there, drinking her body in. And when he finally did touch her again, it was not in a sexual manner. He stroked her face, ran his hand down her body, massaged her back and shoulders, to Danny, it seemed like hours had passed before he finally drew her, flushed and breathless, onto his lap, her heart fluttering in her chest. He cupped her face in his huge hands and looked into her eyes. No, he said, and she knew it was a question. Yes, Danny replied. Okay, so this scene is really important. Drogo preemptively learned a word or two of the common tongue, so something resembling communication could take place, and then used his limited understanding to communicate with his new wife to the best of his ability. Then he treated her like a goddess. He understood that she was young and scared, and instead of just forcibly having his way with her, like we were subjected to in the show, he was gentle. He spent what seemed like hours making sure she felt comfortable. It got to the point where she was breathless and willing. We're really trying our best to keep this as PG as possible, but it's important that people recognize that this marriage wasn't consummated until she wanted to have sex with him. And the fact that Drogo took great care to make this night as special as possible for Danny. After this, Danny and the Kalsar begin the long trek to Vastothrak, so the crones of the Dosh Colleen could give her and Drogo their blessing. During the early part of this journey, we don't get much access to Drogo. He spent his days and evenings with the men of his Kalsar, and returned to their tent each night to have sex with his new wife. These were hard times for Danny. She wasn't used to riding all day and then getting ridden every night. Her entire body hurt, and she was exhausted. Now, was Drogo being the most compassionate guy ever during this period? No. But he also probably knew that she needed to find the strength within herself to survive in a Kalsar, and coddling her probably wouldn't be doing her any favors. And like we mentioned earlier, it's common practice among the Dothraki for calls to share their wives with their blood riders, and Drogo most certainly didn't do that to her. It seems likely that he visited their marital bed every night because he was hoping to get his new bride with child by the time they made it to Vase Dothrak for the crone's approval. He also appears to have completely stopped sleeping with other women since he married Danny. There certainly isn't any evidence that would indicate otherwise. So, while he did kind of leave Danny to her own devices in the beginning, he did continue to treat Danny with respect and dignity in these respects. After Danny's second dragon dream, riding became less of an ordeal for her, and her relations with Drogo also improved. She began riding with him and his blood riders at the head of the column, so that she might see the land untouched by the horde. And, as beautiful as it was, it was completely empty. And as we mentioned at the beginning of the video, no one dares to try to set up a permanent residence here. You can't even try to ride through these lands without the protection of a Kalsar. Then, Danny decided to truly embrace the Dothraki custom of doing everything of import under the open sky, and took Drogo out into the middle of the Kalsar to make a baby. We bring this up because it's another example of Drogo's fearlessness and disregard for what is traditional to Dothraki. 
The Dothraki mate from behind, and Drogo let Danny climb on top of him in sight of his entire Kalazar, which in the eyes of the Dothraki was probably emasculating, but he didn't care. He coupled with his non-Dothraki wife in a very non-Dothraki manner for all to see, which doesn't really sound like much, but when you put it in the context of a man who seems like he wants to show his people another way, it's a small first step. Then they arrive at Vase Dothrak, and Drogo goes hunting, only to return to learn that Robert attempted to have his beloved wife and unborn child murdered. He wasn't happy. He vowed to do what no call had done before, and lead his Kalazar across the poison water, and kill those who would dare to threaten his family, and to take the Iron Throne for his wife and son. The next time we see him was after a bloody battle at Lazar, in the immediate aftermath of Danny taking all the women as her own personal slaves, to save them from being mistreated. It's important to note that Drogo wasn't acting like the rest of his Kalazar. He was just sitting there. And when Mago came to him and complained, Drogo proudly took Danny's side, and basically told him to F off. This is a man that, although ruthless and a warrior to the bone, has little else in common with the rest of his people. Okay, so let's try to tie all this together. The Dothraki Sea was once one of the best places to live in the entirety of the world that George created. It is now a wasteland, thanks to the Dothraki who came pouring out of the east to destroy absolutely everything in their path, and has become such a dangerous place that the calls actually had to institute a custom that decrees that their wives will be brought to Vase Dothrak, where no blood can be shed, making it the only place that their wives could go, where they won't be raped or killed or enslaved once they're gone. At the point where our story begins, the Dothraki Sea is ostensibly ruled by Drogo, a man George elected to liken to Aegon the Dragonlord the first time he introduced him to us who also seems likely to have been the true owner of the dragon eggs that Illyrio gifted Danny at their wedding. It should also be noted that he's been of marrying age for quite some time, and he never got married, which might imply that he was waiting for a bride that could further his ambitions. The bride he chose was not just Valyrian, as there are tons of Valyrian women in Essos, but a Targaryen a member of the only dragon lord family that survived the doom. Speaking of his ambitions, he has powerful friends from all over the world. There must be a reason that he befriended these men, and on the reverse side, there has to be a reason that these men befriended him. Then there's the fact that he owns a manse and maintains it in a manner that one would expect of someone who truly values it, and he enjoys fine wine. Both of these facts indicate that he has developed a taste for the finer things in life. He's also very smart and picks up languages quickly. He's a patient man that spends most of his time observing and seldom speaks without a reason to do so. He doesn't participate in the casual barbarism that is characteristic of his people, and he treats his wife with respect and love. And lastly, he appears hell-bent on fulfilling the stallion that mounts the world prophecy. So, when you put all of this together, what does it mean? Well, in our minds, it boils down to three things. The first is his tendency to people watch. Drogo is a smart guy, and as a smart guy that spends much of his time watching the purposeless existence of the people that he rules, where they just travel around killing and enslaving people for the sake of it, with no end game in mind. He has to be looking at it and thinking that this is pure madness. The other two kind of work best when placed together. He's laser-focused on fulfilling the stallion that mounts the world prophecy, and when you combine that with his diverse group of friends from all over the world, 
in our minds, it really starts to paint a picture of a man that wants to make some pretty substantial changes and is smart enough to know that cowing the Dothraki will require dragons, just as the histories and his mural tell us. So, what did he do? He got his hands on three dragon eggs, then sought out a female with dragon lord lineage to be his wife, so he could hatch them. Once the dragons grow, he and his dragon lord's son can use them to unite all the Dothraki under their banner, fulfilling the stallion that mounts the world prophecy. Being a united people would also make peace amongst the Dothraki possible, and with this peace, he could then begin using his worldwide network of friends to set up trade and make use of the land that he rules. Now, does that sound like anyone else that we know? Aegon I united Westeros and put an end to the constant infighting, which made it possible for Westeros to truly thrive. If Drogo had a similar goal, maybe that's why George decided to introduce him to us as Aegon the Dragonlord come again. <laughs> <laughs>